in the sacrament again in such a reverent manner. With thanks for their service each week. We would like to welcome the Lowell's with us today. I have somewhat mixed emotions about letting them go, to tell you the truth. They're such a wonderful part of our ward, and they bless the life of so many within our ward, and my family in particular. But we're grateful, and I know that the people of Pennsylvania will be also grateful for them, for the missionary service that is to come. We would like to now hear from our first speaker, which will be Sister Carol Lowe. After Carol has concluded her comments, we'll have a special musical number by the two grandchildren. Brother Tim Key's children, it's going to be great to hear from them. Tim and I go way back. Good friends. Great to see his children growing up so fast. After we've heard from the few children, our concluding speaker will be Brother Ron Lowe, and we will proceed to that point. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't expect all of you here today. <laughs> it's so good to see you. I... Uh, <clears throat> I have a problem if I keep wiping my nose, it's because I have an irritated nose that bleeds easily, <laughs> and unfortunately it just started bleeding. <laughs> uh, but you are my dear, dear friends, my dear children and grandchildren, and ward members and family, and sisters and brothers from the temple. <laughs> You've all touched my life, so I'm grateful that we get to partake of the sacrament this day, and I pray that <clears throat> what I say will not detract from that. It's been a wonderful week. I was able to go to the Thursday dedication of the Nauru Temple and see how tender President Hinckley was, and it was and to feel his testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. I know that they are prophets. I know President Hinckley is a prophet, and I'm grateful for him. The bishopric has asked me to speak on <coughs> the pre uh, Elder Bam Banks' address in priesthood session of conference, April 2002. This road we call life. And he starts out by reading a portion of the letter from the First Presidency in the very, in the new, uh, for the strength of the youth. And it says, Our beloved young men and women, we have great confidence in you. Doesn't that thrill you? I think that's so wonderful <laughs> to think that he has great confidence in, especially the youth of the church. You are choice spirits who have come forth in this day when the responsibilities and opportunities as well as temptations, are the greatest. You are at the beginning of your journey through this mortal life. Your Heavenly Father wants your life to be joyful. Can you imagine that? <laughs> With all the little restrictions we feel we ha sometimes have, it's all to make us happy and to, leading back and, lead and to lead you back into his presence. The decisions you make now will determine much of what will follow during your life and throughout eternity. Elder Banks' family loves to go ride bicycles, and they quite often ride bicycles for their family trips. And recently, they wrote, took a trip from Bozeman, Montana, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It's 225 miles, and they took three days and they got to go through beautiful mountain passes and scenery, and they crossed the Continental Divide two or three times. I forget. <laughs> anyway, they le he learned some lessons from this trip that he thinks applies to our life, and it does. Especially, he was talking to the youth that I think all of us can apply pr these principles to our lives. The first day of the trip, 
they were all excited because they had prepared really well. And the sky was blue, and the wind was at their back, and they were ready to go. And they started on their trip. And it wasn't long before big black clouds came in the sky. And it started raining. And then it started sleeting. That's like ice, icy rain, really cold. And then there came hail. And they were miserable and they were cold. <clears throat> but they were well prepared, so they had the clothing necessary to keep going, even though it was hard. And he said, he realized when that day was over, he was full of hope and optimism because they had prepared well. But obstacles come to us in our lives, don't they? It isn't always easy. It isn't always downhill and sunshiny. And sometimes we have to go through those. Um, there's some things I have learned in my life and from the scriptures and from other people's talks that I would like to apply here. The first thing I thought of is, since we're getting ready to leave, is to travel light. <laughs> and some of us on our um, journey in life carry rocks around in our backpacks. And when the, it's really hard to carry heavy backpacks that have rocks in them on trips that aren't going to do us any good. Can you imagine what those rocks are? They're little sins that we have. Maybe we haven't forgiven someone. Maybe we haven't uh, cleaned our vocabulary up very well. Maybe we uh, have done things that we should have repented of. Maybe somebody's hurt us really bad and we don't want to let it go, turn it over to the Lord, and so we carry it with us and it drags us down. One of the nice things, one of the most portable things we can take with us on our trips that in life that doesn't isn't heavy at all is prayer. We can pray anywhere we want. That doesn't mean we can always kneel down in our car while we're driving and pray. <laughs> it just means that sometimes when you hit an icy road and you're thinking, I'm not in control of this car, <laughs> and you're saying a little prayer in your mi mind and heart, please, Heavenly Father, help me to stay on the road. But we can take prayer with us wherever we go. It's very portable. Also, the Holy Ghost is portable. When we pray and we study the scriptures, the Spirit comes into our lives to give us guidance. Following the leaders, they're like signs around the, on the road that gives us directions. And most important of all, we can look to our Savior, the Son. One of my favorite scripts is, is found in Moroni 10, and I love that whole chapter, and I won't read it all to you at all. <laughs> But one of the parts that I really like is toward the end, and he's pleading, Moroni's pleading with us when we read the Book of Mormon to come unto Christ and be perfected in him. Deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and if you deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ and ye can no wise deny the power of God. I'd just like to emphasize that last phrase. Do not deny the power of God in your life. Do let him carry your, your backpacks that are full of things that you don't need to carry. He will heal you. He will help you. President Hinckley quotes Commander William Robert Anderson. And I'm sure that my friend, Brother Davis, knows this, who this person is. He was the first commander to take the atomic submarine underneath the North Pole. Oh, I mentioned Brother Davis because he's here from Idaho, and he was my missionary who baptized me in the church. <laughs> and he came here with his wife, who he baptized. So we're grateful to have him here. Anyway... Commander Anderson 
said this. He always keeps a card with him. It says, I believe I'm always divinely guided. I believe I will always take the right road. I believe he will always make a way where there is no way. We too can believe in ourselves. We are divine. We are of divine heritage, children of our Heavenly Father who loves us. We too can always take the right road. We can listen to the Spirit, the prophets, the teachings of, the, of our leaders, and be obedient. We too can believe that he will always make a way where there is no way. Some of you may or may not know, but I wanted to serve a mission 37 years ago, and I was at BYU, and I had taken lessons, and... Uh, from the missionary discussions, and when I went home that summer, the ward, Filer Ward, where I was, said they'd support me on my mission, and I finally convinced my dad, and he said he'd support me, and the state presidency were excited, and the general authority came, and he said, oh, you're not to go on a mission, you're to go back to BYU and prepare to get married, and I said, I don't know anybody I want to marry. <laughs> and I was crying, and state president was crying, and so he went back to the general authority and fled my case. <laughs> and he came back and said, no, you are supposed to go back. Two weeks before BYU started, I went back to BYU. <laughs> and the very next Sunday, I was in his ward. <laughs> so... I was like, seven months later, we were married. <laughs> so I had a little, little detour. It was a good goal, but the Lord said, not now. So I get to go, <laughs> and I'm grateful, especially for my companion. He's an inspiration to me always. Robert Frost has a poem, The Road Not Taken, and I won't because of time, read it all to you, but two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. I'm so grateful for the church in my life. So grateful. My parents were good parents. They were good examples to me. But I got, I had a little bit of opposition when I joined the church from friends and family members, but I'm so glad I took that road. Thank you. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which leads to Elder Banks' second day. On the second day, it was a perfect day. They had rested their legs. Uh, the sun shone, and it was pretty easy to make your way through the mountains. It wasn't so up and down. It was pretty easy for them. And he said, you know, it's that way in life. Sometimes when things are really easy, easy for us, we take all the uh, credit. <laughs> He said, don't make that mistake. When things are going well for you, acknowledge him who gives you those blessings. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, happiness is an object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof. If we pursue that path, what is the path? Virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping the commandments. Always remember the true source of your blessings. On the final day, Elder Banks family climbed 4,800 from 4,800 feet to 8,300 feet. Climbing steep mountain passes on a bike requi requires the right attitude to get to the right altitude. So it was all up here. They had prepared well, but the last the last while going up and down the mountains was really hard. He says, "This is when your self-discipline and." Commitment to a goal comes true. Uh, 
he told, also told a story about Elder Richard G. Scott and himself canoeing in Canada. And they would take their canoes from lake to lake, carry them around. So it was in a wilderness area. They were on a large lake one time, and the sky was blue. Another good story. <laughs> the sky was blue, and everything was fine. The water was tranquil. They get partway across the lake, and here comes one of those storms, a huge storm. And it started, the waves started tossing their little light canoe up and down and to and fro. And they said, do we try to make it to shore, to our campsite, or do we stay? They could see an island close by. Do we go to it? The prompt, they, they uh, the spirit came to them immediately and prompted them to go right to the island which they did just in time because the storm turned out much worse than they thought and they would have, uh, their lives would have been in peril. Sometimes times in our life we have to take detours that are really important for us to avoid hazards. Be sure to seek the Spirit as Nephi taught in 31 and 18. You have entered the way you have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son, and you have received the Holy Ghost. And in ch verse 20, Wherefore you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having the perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Where if you wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, endure to the end. Behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. In closing, I would like to read the last part of this letter from the First Presidency. They say, We pray for each of you. May you keep your minds and bodies clean from the sins of the world so that you can do the great work that lies before you. And I believe that. I believe every person that's born on this earth has a great mission. And only you can do it. There's others that might have to take your place. They could not do it as well as you could have if you, you had completed your mission. So please keep yourselves worthy to receive those promptings. We pray that you'll be worthy to carry on the responsibility of building the kingdom of God and preparing the world for the second coming of the Savior. I pray that as we go forth, all of us, that we will be strengthened in our testimony to help build up the kingdom and prepare it for the Savior's return. And what joy Ron and I will have when we return again here and feel of your strength and your faith and your love again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
It's also been our privilege this week to be present at the setting apart of a new mission president to go to Enugu, Nigeria. And it was done by Elder Holland, which brings to mind my present condition. Elder Holland tells a story that kind of describes Carol Nye. He talks about the feelings of a donkey who finds himself entered in the Kentucky Derby. Those of you who know Carol will feel sorry for me. So. <laughs> Our prophet, as optimistic a prophet as there ever has been, spoke to the brethren at this last conference in a way that he didn't feel comfortable because he could not be as positive as he prefers to be. As I went through that talk again, I remembered our youngest son making an observation that really shocked me. He said, Dad, um, <coughs> I guess you guys are just waiting for us to grow up so you guys can and go away so you guys can have fun. <laughs> and And... And that was not what I wanted to hear. (laughs) I did not want to give that impression at all. But somehow he was getting it. Stephen Hinckley's talk is similar. I'd like to review what we know and why people would think that way. We know that not very long ago there was a war. A war in heaven. Interestingly enough, that war was because of an invitation. Heavenly Father was inviting us to become just like him. He wanted all his sons to become heavenly fathers. He wanted all his daughters to become heavenly mothers. And the war was over that. One third of the hosts of heaven resisted the invitation, fought against it. And we're crossed out to earth. And we're waiting down now for us to come. And they were going to try and make us regret or give up hope of ever becoming heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. Adam and Eve came down and were valiant. But it didn't last very long for their children. So many of their children were tricked by Satan. They turned the other way. They gave up hope of ever becoming heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. Enoch was sent to see if there were any left who still wanted to be heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. And against great resistance and great opposition and persecution, he was able to find a group of people who were so wonderful that the heavenly father took them away from the earth. Things got worse and worse until the heavenly father decided to terminate those who were on the earth. And eight people were saved in the ark. All the rest had become influenced by Satan, had been tricked into giving up becoming heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. And so it happened in the times of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Those great prophets came to tell people what we can become. And few would listen. The Savior himself came and bore testimony that we are the children of God. And the Jews tried to stone him for saying a thing like that. They resisted the invitation to become heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. After nearly 2,000 years, Heavenly Father fulfilled the prophet's promises that he'd given to the prophets who had worked so hard in times past. Many of them were blessed because nobody would listen to them. They were at least allowed to see the end times. The end times when there would be a people on this earth who wanted to be Heavenly Fathers and Heavenly Mothers. Great men like Isaiah saw our day. He talked about an ensign to the nations. He talked about the 
with temples being built in the tops of the mountains. The mountain of the house of the Lord. And people would come from all, all over the earth. But from this temple and this area where this temple is would go forth this invitation and so many people would respond to this invitation that eventually it would bind Satan for a thousand years to fulfill that promise and prophecy. A new beachhead had to be established on the earth that was completely under the power of Satan. It was a prince of this world, of the worldly myth. Then on that spring morning, of 1820, Joseph again found out about the invitation when he was visited by Heavenly Father and his marvelous son. And that was the beginning of the return. Three years later, that great stalwart missionary writer, Mor Moroni, came and began to tutor Joseph Smith and told Joseph Smith, in no uncertain terms, that those who rejected the idea of becoming mothers and fathers, heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers, he said, they that come shall burn them, and they shall be without root nor branch. In other words, they become people with no descendants and no ancestors. They would cease to be part of the most wonderful thing we can be part of, and that is a family. You have to love being in a family, and you have to love being part of a family, and you have to honor a family to survive that journey. John the Baptist came to make it possible for those who wanted to to be adopted back into the family through the use of the keys of baptism. 1829, then on that glorious day that we don't have a date for, Peter, James, and John returned. And I am sure Satan and all of hell were disturbed that day. It was a day of stress and difficulty for Joseph and Oliver. But they returned and they bestowed upon Joseph and Oliver the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood. The Melchizedek priesthood, which is the training program for heavenly fathers and is an order of things that helps them relate to those who are to become heavenly mothers. That power, that order was restored to the earth. And soon after that, the church was restored to this earth as well. That church, which responsibility is to build family, to help people find out how important family is, so that in their heart, the children of God would find out who they really were and would have a desire to be like their Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And that's a wonderful day. Six years later, all of the keys to accomplish this were returned to the Kirtland Temple. In a glorious manifestation of power, visitors from the other side came. Elias, Elijah, Moses, and the Savior himself, saying, from this day the blessings will go forth to all the nations of the earth. Satan waged a tremendous battle then to stop the church. It became so difficult that the prophet and those who supported him had to flee from Kirtland. And men had to be called and sent on missions to England to save the church. Save the church which was to save the family on the earth. And through their persecution and difficulties, they rose. Many wonderful people came into the church and in Nauvoo. We have had a wonderful <coughs> example to us of faith and of valor, of great courage, of an 
impossible difficulty. And our people, who no matter what happens, we stand by the cross. And we are celebrating that time now. Just as we honor those, as President Hinckley did in the dedicatory services, I know the day will come when they will talk about us. This generation, these young people, will be talked about with the reverence and respect. Because this is the generation that will bind Satan for a thousand years and enable all the families who want to be together to be together forever. Now, why was President Hickley negative? We are winning the war. We are moving forward. We are building states. How many states a year? 300,000 people. That's 100 states a year. More than that. We are winning. The trouble is we're losing too. Satan is still tricking many of our numbers. He's tricking our missionaries. President Hinckley pleaded with him and read to him a statement, the first presence he made. Do not ever be separated from your companion. Oh, how true that is, how important it is. I don't know how many, but there are missionaries who get sick. And they do that and they go down. And when you go down, then you go on the other side because you're no longer helping the Lord. And I bear testimony of that danger. On my mission, I was blessed with stupidity rather than revelation. And that's the next best way to keep out of trouble. But I remember teaching a young had a, a young woman and her parents and family, and um, they were the only people in the whole town who would listen to us. The members of the church knew this family and said, do all you can to get them. So we really worked hard. And one day, the family sort of worked it so that I was no longer with my companion. He was with the parents, and I was left alone with her. Now, because I was really stupid, I didn't know that she'd taken a liking to me. I had no idea. Somebody that cute, she was nearly as cute as Carol. But I just was too dumb to catch on, and I felt really uneasy, and I had to go find my companion. And oh, was I glad when I found out, realized later on what had happened. My companion was disappointed. He wished it was him so he could take her back to the United States with him. She was a really nice girl, but they had, they had separated us so that something could happen that shouldn't. Satan and sin separate us. Righteousness binds us as families, as missionaries, as members. When we live the gospel, we are in a bond of righteousness and we are protected from all evil. And the brethren have now pleaded with the missionaries and so on. President Hinckley cites many scriptures that have to do with us thinking the right thing as priesthood holders. If we don't think the right things, we will be separated from our loved ones. We are told to let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly. In other words, think good things. That doesn't mean what you see here. Maybe channel 34 is okay. But unless we let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly, we stop becoming... Heavenly fathers and heavenly mothers. And it's a marvelous invitation, and nobody should miss that. Beth Hinckley talks about some of our members who've been deceived into thinking that it's satisfying to abuse one another, to enjoy positions where we can abuse our wives or our children. And oh, what a warning! The Savior was so kind, warned that people who are guilty of this would be better off if a millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the ocean. It was so sad these days. I used to get mad with bad people. And the Lord has helped me to see a little different. Every time I hear about somebody who's really evil, 
My mind goes back to when they were the babies. And they were so cute and so innocent and eager to learn. What happened? Who did this to them? Who made them bitter? Who offended them? When the Savior says offending was bad, I don't think he meant anybody who irritates their kids is going to be in trouble. I believe he was saying anybody who causes their faith to falter, anybody who causes them to lose that desire to learn and to grow and to become and to hope and to be positive in their outlook, whoever causes that and replaces it with cynicism and doubt and bitterness will really regret it. And there's so much sadness in the world today because there are those who have been tricked into using their position to make other people feel terrible. Unfortunately, some of those are priesthood holders. As I understand it, when we receive the priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, we represent the Savior. From that moment on, we become other people's introduction to Jesus. Other people find out what Jesus is like when they watch a priesthood holder who's magnifying his calling. A priesthood holder really magnifies his calling is a wonderful introduction to the Savior. Just as when they, Philip asked the Savior, show us the Father, and Jesus said, he's seen me, he's seen the Father. When you have witnessed a valiant priesthood holder, you will know exactly what the Savior is like. Oh! I'm so afraid of becoming a father because I'm so afraid that I would really foul things up. I, when I was 24, I remember saying, sort of committing, I will never get married so I'm perfect. Then I won't lead my kids astray. I gave up when I was 30 and handed myself over to Carol. Uh, she improved my driving and a lot of other things. And my kids have had to live with the idea that their dad is practicing on them. He really doesn't mean to be bad. He's just practicing. <laughs> and they've responded very well. And they've honored me. And they've inspired me. To be what I was sent here to be. Let me close this session with these final words. Now, brethren, <clears throat> I suppose that I have sounded negative as I have spoken to you this evening. I do not wish to, but I do wish to raise a warning voice to the priesthood of this church throughout the world. Now, listen to these wonderful words. God has bestowed upon us a gift most precious and wonderful it carries with the authority to govern the church, to administer in its affairs, to speak to authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to act as his dedicated servants, to bless the sick, to bless our family, and many others. It serves as a guide by which, we, which to live our lives. In its fullness, its authority reaches beyond the veil of death into the eternities that lie ahead. There is nothing else to compare with it in all this world. Safeguard it. Cherish it. Love it. Live worthy of it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's my humble prayer as I leave my blessing upon you and extend my love in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. like to thank all those that have heard.